It's time to take a new approach to finding true fulfillment in your career, health, and state of mind through insightful conversations with those who have found their professional and personal passions while achieving balance. Whether it's entrepreneurs, athletes, or healthcare professionals, we bring you real people, real growth, right here on the Boost Podcast. Now, here's your host, Elena Lipson. Hey, Boo Squad, and welcome to episode 33. Elena Lipson here, and I am thrilled to introduce today's featured guest, Stephanie Gage. Stephanie, are you ready to join the Boo Squad? I'm so ready. So before we dive into today's episode, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Mosaic Growth Partners. Mosaic Growth Partners provides growth strategy consulting to entrepreneurs and organizations in the healthcare and older adult baby boomer market. They can help you bring a new product or service to market, identify and engage new customers and partners, or grow your market share. They also provide coaching and training. For more information, go to mosaicgrowth.com. That's M-O-S-A-I-C-G-R-O-W-T-H dot com. Now back to today's featured guest. So Stephanie is the founder of Spark Career Strategy, which she launched in 2010. And what began as a dedicated career coaching for what's next professionals blossomed into organizational development and human resources consulting, career and performance coaching, and group training offerings. As the name suggests, Stephanie delivers both spark and strategy to each company and client that she works with. She's a lover of change, whether it's changing minds with learning, changing careers with career coaching, changing businesses with innovation and design, or changing behaviors with performance coaching. And prior to launching her own business, she held a number of human resource positions in different organizations, including U.S. Pharmacopeia and Chevy Chase Bank. She's also a passionate supporter of the U.S. military, and in 2016, she founded Call to Action, which is a nonprofit organization that delivers exceptional career transition strategies to U.S. veterans and military spouses to successfully leverage their unique talents for civilian careers. So a lot to talk about with you today, Stephanie. So let's just dive right on in. What are the three things that we should know about Spark Career Strategy? Well, that's an awesome introduction. Thank you so much. I love and cringe hearing all of that. (laughs) (laughs) The things to know about Spark Career Strategy and Call to Action is that exactly what you said in the introduction, change is my game. And it's all about everything I do comes down to changing. And that, as you said, is changing changing careers, mind, perspectives, behaviors. So it can be something really subtle, like someone who's coming in and saying, every job I go to, I work with jerks. And you think, okay, well, is everybody a jerk? Or can we do some self-evaluation and maybe make some tweaks in how you, your emotional intelligence. And all of a sudden it really shifts their dynamic and their, their happiness in their job, the stability in their job. And it actually it blossoms out, right? So little tweaks to big career shifts can make such a huge difference. So that's the first thing that I'm really passionate about. And then the second is that, again, it's a ripple effect. So what we do with one change is really something that that spirals. So it becomes, okay, we tweaked how you're looking at your colleagues, but now that's a changing how you look at your partner or a spouse or your children or how you interact. So the effect of that change has the ability to have a really wide reach, which is very cool. And the third thing is my business started as my entire focus. So a lot of your listeners are probably in that all consuming phase, but my business has really now become just a part of my purpose. And I have been able to, through this incredible seven year journey, been able to make it my entire life. That's something that almost ate me up to something that I feel really controlled and purposeful in. Great. So I have a bunch of questions. One, it sounds like, you know, you're really a transformer of change for a lot of people, but when they come to you, are most of your clients ready for change or are they still kind of resistant to the idea of having to change their perspective and their outlook and their behaviors? Oh, total resistant. Change is the worst. <laughs> people, most people, even if you know you have to change, right? Even if you, you're coming to me saying something is wrong or I'm so miserable in the job I'm in, 
when the reality comes that you actually have to put in work to make change, that change isn't just something that magically fairy dusts over you, then it becomes like, well, hell, you know what? Maybe, maybe where I am isn't so bad or, you know, but the problem really isn't me. It's really, yeah, I shouldn't change their assholes, you know? So that can be really difficult is first recognizing what change is going to take and buying into the work of change. And then also allowing yourself to sort of give into it and say, okay, you know what, what I'm doing right now isn't working. So I am going to be open to this, even if it is a little bit painful. Yeah. And how do you get people to buy into the idea of change? You know, if I have to get them too much to buy into it, then it's unlikely to be really successful. So people have to be, have to get there organically. And, and I can offer tools. So I find that, you know, once someone knows what the strategy is, right? So it comes down, if I say, okay, you're going to change job. This is great. And I say, we're going to go one, two, three, four, and five steps, and it's going to get you there. And here's the work that goes in between that calms the fear factor out of change with a plan, right? So then folks can say, okay, you know what, now I can, I can prepare, I can take a deep breath and take this dive. But ultimately, if someone's too resistant to it, they're going to bail out at some point. So you have to get there. And sometimes the best way to get to a point of change is being really, really uncomfortable. That was definitely how I changed and went from corporate America to being an entrepreneur is that I was miserable and it was the... The only other option was staying where I was, and that was worse than the fear of change. <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that. I think that's a lot of the reason why I started my business, too. I know a lot of other people have done that, too, because when you're comfortable, you have no need to change. Most people don't have that enough drive inside of them to push them to change when they're comfortable in their current situation. So it sounds like having some type of plan where they can take things in almost like bite size chunks mm -hmm. instead of just presenting the whole end goal is a good way to encourage people to be open to change. Absolutely. Entirely. Yeah. So I want to follow up on another point that you made. So you said when you started off, your business was like all consuming. It was all you did. And now you've managed to make it like one component of your greater purpose. And I want to know how you did that. Well, I became a mom <laughs> and that was, if I hadn't, I probably would have gone full tilt. So my first three years of the business were entirely consuming. So I got up, I thought about this every minute. I didn't sleep well at night because I would come up with so many ideas. And I was also super bootstrapping my business as a solopreneur and as a consultant, you know, if I didn't land a client, I didn't have any source of income. So everything was that was anxiety around how do I continue to feed myself? So you never felt like you could shut off the business. So that, you know, spurred me to some solid growth and, and kept things moving for those first years. But it also, again, it, it consumed everything. I don't think I had a conversation with any of my friends for those first three years that wasn't all about Spark, right? So, and they're probably, they were so supportive and wonderful. And, and my team was and my partner, but at some point, it's like, shut up already. <laughs> <laughs> and then I became a mom and all of a sudden the brakes went on and I thought, okay, I can't go at this, this pace. And now I need to just step back and reevaluate what I need my values to be. And my business felt like it was the boss of me, which is interesting and ironic. And all of a sudden I stepped back and said, okay, well, I need to get back into the driver's seat even though I'm an entrepreneur, I feel as though this, this has a life force of its own. And I stepped back and said, okay, I am going to pare this down. I am not going to take on this kind of project, this. So I made some really intentional choices to dial back and reprioritize. That's great. So then when you do that, do you take a hit to your income or are you just working Holy smarter? No, I mean, I, I do think I was working smarter, but no, it was substantial hit. And again, I had to, I had to be in a position to, to make that choice and not everyone can make the same, the same decision, but I went, you know, and I wasn't alone. So that helped in, in doing some of this, but you also made other decisions like, okay, well, 
some of the free income we had, we don't. So some of what I was, you know, willing to play with and vacations, I now recognize I'm swapping out because in effect, I'm a stay at home mom who also works her business kind of as my side hustle now. Mm -hmm. So it was just the decision, but it definitely dried out my pockets. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, I was curious about that. And are you happier now with having more balance between being a working mom and how you were before when you were just all consumed by the business? You know, it was double edge. My, I'll be honest, my ego took a little bit of a hit because even though it's this really decided point and you said, yes, I am going to, I'm going to say no to this or no, I'm not going to speak. Or if they're not paying me, I can't do the same gigs. I've got to make some priority shifts and, and some of that or I'm only going to take on this many clients and then the rest I have to say no to, which was hard. It was those words got stuck in my throat, but it was also a a big ego hit to say, Oh, I'm not making this anymore. Or, Oh, that event that, that women empowerment event was happening here. And I wasn't one of the speakers. Never mind, I didn't put myself forward for it, but still your mind sort of plays that and your ego gets in check. So there was definitely some, gratitude around having this part of my life and being a mom, but also I had to struggle with readjusting myself and saying, okay, how am I rebranding and seeing myself differently even in this decision point? Yeah. It's hard when your whole identity is wrapped up in your career and your profession, and then you kind of pull back from that. And then there must be a moment of like, well, who am I if I'm not defined by what I thought defined me. So that's got to be pretty scary. But since you're a master of change, it sounds like you've kind of navigated that <laughs> pretty well. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so I want to understand a little bit more when you look at careers and career transitions, what do you see now and in the future? There's this huge shift from just in how people are even educated, what employers are looking for and why people are going to work. So this shift from taking care of our families and having some of that stability, our 401ks, our retirement, that has really shifted to this purpose economy. So we are in the midst of that. And I would the research out there and some of the, the thought leaders in this space are suggesting that in within three years, we're at a full tipping point that companies who are not leading with purpose are not going to be competitive to consumers and to employees. So even as as I hire or as I'm training organization, I see that people more than ever need to be connected to the mission of an organization. So that is a big shift. Not that people didn't want to feel like they were contributing, but now it is one of the, if not the most important driver in why someone is choosing an employer and staying with an employer. So as I counsel and coach folks in organizations or looking to transition into, one of the first things they we start with is really understanding their value systems and what type of purpose they want to connect themselves to. So that is really cool, but it's a big difference. Yeah, I actually didn't realize that. I've always kind of leaned that way where I've always kind of had like one foot in the public sector and one foot in the private sector because I like the pace of the private sector, but I love having that mission-driven work, but I didn't know that the whole economy was shifting that way. That's really interesting. And it actually makes me wonder, is that kind of what led you to found Call to Action in 2016? Because that's very mission-driven. And can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this, again, some of the the great things that came out of me downshifting a bit was the ability to step back and have a little bit of clarity and space. And out of that came exactly that, exactly what you said, which was, how do I continue to make an impact that if I was going to have my business or, or be doing anything that I felt like it really needed to, to matter and count. And for me, that was supporting a community that I think is just extraordinary. And I was at that point living in the DC area. So we have, I live down the street from the Walter Reed Hospital. I was near and around so many incredible bases and military was just just all around. And I see that there is such a substantial need for transition support because their employers don't get it, don't get how to translate the skills of our service members to their business and bottom line. 
And I just saw some really huge gaps and very much without even putting words to it, I was absolutely following my own purpose economy. That's great. So give us three tactics for how you've grown your business, whether it was to get it off the ground or to kind of go in this new direction where you're being a little more choosy about who you work with. Yeah. So, well, the first one was just, was bootstrapping. I, I will say that the the first and, and my tactic, again, is other, other people will have far bigger budgets, but I was working as a solopreneur and having to learn everything from web development via YouTube videos to marketing and SEO and, and even getting my own message right, which took years, right, to really hone in on who is my audience and who connects with me. So for me, it was just being as aware of, of the business as I could, but also then quickly understanding what pieces I was no good at and then getting the right team. So that may look like an intern that could look like going to freelance and getting some support, working my network, but it was saying, I need to know as much as possible and I need to do it on the cheap, but I also then need to quickly redirect and say, if I'm really going to make this into my primary income, I need people who are smarter than me in certain areas. So that was definitely the first. And second for me is because, again, I didn't have a marketing budget. I'm just this, you know, a single shop doing something that is important, as I saw it, that referrals were huge for me. Referrals were everything. Companies, my network of companies came through, of of folks that I consulted with, came through people in the HR world that knew what I was doing. And I was vocal about what I was doing. I needed to be present. I needed people to hear so that I came to top of mind. And then from folks that I was coaching, I would say, if this really mattered to you and something resonated, let your friends know. And then how can we work together and how can you team up and, and some of that? So referrals was huge. And then I was willing to be seen and be out to get the recognition and get some of the momentum I needed. So that was a really important tactic for me as well, which meant, again, my first years that I did more for free than I did for pay. But there was a tipping point then at some point when I had the book of business behind me, when I had the referrals, when I had the even the marketing clips to show that all of a sudden now I could command a different rate because I had done some of this open and free on the front end to build credibility, to build a book of business. So that, as you can see, again, every business is a little bit different, but mine started in that way. And and I needed to get creative about how to open doors in a, you know, in a way that didn't put me in competition with a big business because I could never do something like that. Yeah. And I think that's something that a lot of small businesses struggle with, particularly when they're like coaching or consulting, because you're competing with big firms that have a lot more resources that people like you and I just don't have. But so have you ever been able to transition a client where you did something for them for free into a paying client? And if so, how did you do that? Sure, absolutely. So it's, again, it's sort of that that proving ground. This is like, if any of your listeners are in kind of the nine to five gig It's the employer that says, yeah, I'll promote you as soon as you start doing the job, right? And you're Mm -hmm. like, oh, well, that sucks, but okay. So it was that idea of I needed to prove what I could do. So for example, I had an organization that wanted to bring me on as a coach for their internal employees, which was wonderful and awesome and really thoughtful of the company. They got that the more the investment they made in coaching their employees really turned into an ROI for them. But they said, you know what, I need to make sure that this, that this really works and that you're a fit for our culture and our employees. So they had me do it for two employees for a very set period of time with very measurable results. And at that point we evaluated and said, okay, great. This is working. Now we can go forward. So I'm all for that. But what the big piece of doing anything for free is that the deliverable or measurable needs to be very, very clear. And the timeline needs to be super defined because, Hey, can, you know, let's just do this and see how it works can turn into like six months later, you're still schlepping around for free for some folks. Right? So it was, you know, I'm willing to do this for 
a three week period. I'm going to meet twice with each person. We're going to get to this and we'll evaluate. Here's the survey or whatever the case is, however you want to measure that. And once it was really defined, then I was comfortable with it. And I didn't feel like I was being taken advantage of. Yeah, those are really great points. Because I have companies that approach me all the time and say, well, you advise us. And it's like, really loosey goosey. And they're like, and we can't pay you any money, but we can get you some free meals. And well, that's lovely. Like I can't make a living off of free dinners. <laughs> and and so I love your, your ideas of making it time-based and very specific to an actual deliverable. And I think that's a great way to kind of almost pilot your services with someone. So great tip there. Another thing you mentioned was talking about getting your business from referrals and promoting yourself. And so were you someone that was always comfortable promoting yourself or did you have to like get in that mindset? Oh no, it's horrendous. <laughs> Anything, it's gross. Anything sales related makes me want to dive under a desk. <laughs> I absolutely hate it. So for me, I, I had to find first, I wanted to do this very, like very salesy, approach, you know, because that's sort of what you read and you watch and it's this, you know, like dive in here and here's the three points to sell and here's how to close the deal. And I thought, oh my God, this is so inauthentic. I can hear it coming out of my mouth and I I sound horrendous. So then it was dialing it back and saying, you know, if I can just tell a story, which is exactly where marketing is going, right? Everything is story-based. So if I can just tell somebody when they ask me what I do, a story about someone I've been successful with, then people would say, oh, I want that too. So in fact, the key for me in selling myself was never talking about myself. It was talking about the folks that I worked with because they were the people I I cared about. Talking about them, telling their story, and then allowing the person that was hearing it to self-select in and say, oh my gosh, I relate to that. I want that too. Yeah, that's great. And that makes a lot of sense. And you talk about how you were originally kind of had this sales approach that just didn't feel like you. And I've made that mistake too at times as well. And you can really see that it's not you when you see the results not happening. And I've always found that like just being you, being authentic, saying what you think, for me at least, has been much more effective than like following some method that might have worked for somebody else, but it's not really yes. you. So that's a great point. So tell us about a time when you've stagnated or you stopped making progress and then how you got things back on track. Well, that's, it goes back to that, that life shift. And I, you know, again, by choice, but also what I found is the folks that during that period of time, you know, three years I'd built up some momentum, right. And there was this shift and it was like, okay, this is coming. Things are coming to me. I don't have to be out here dancing for dollars so hard. And then I went off the scene, right? Because now I've got a baby attached to my boob and I'm, you know, up all night and I'm tired and I can't be out networking and doing all this stuff, right? So all of a sudden the pipeline of folks coming to me was getting more dry and more dry and more dry. And pretty soon it was Sahara up here. Like there was nothing coming in. So that for me was how do I shift and give people something new to talk about, right? So how do I get back and get relevant? For me, that was following the purpose economy, following my passion down the other avenue of launching call to action, because it gave me again, a new burst of energy. It gave me something new to be talking about. It gave me new stories to be relevant to. So even when I pitched myself to local news channels or or larger news networks, I now could attach to, okay, well, we've got this many people being withdrawn from this area, according to the president now. So now I can attach to that story and talk about what I'm doing with call to action, for example. So it gave me a new breath of life and something new and relevant to talk about, to get back on the scene. And that allowed me to then sway back into, oh, hey, remember Spark Career Strategy? Yeah, I still do that. That's awesome. So it sounds like you've done a really good job navigating this kind of balanced life between being a mom and working on your business, but not making it like your number one thing that's all consuming. So what are some of the things that you do to take care of yourself? No. Oh, do I take care of myself? (laughs) I know I take care of my family and 
And I guess I take care of myself somewhat. You know, the first thing is that I I got rid of this BS idea of balance because that was stressing me out. You know, when I looked around or I read articles about like, here's how to do it and here's how to set the perfect balance. I thought, oh, well, I hate all of those people and they're not me and I'm not getting it. So as soon as I stopped thinking that there was a magic balance of things, then it allowed me to say, okay, well, this day I was really work heavy, but tomorrow I'm taking off and and to find my own sort of stride. So it was incorporating work into family and family out of it. And then just at the end of the day, deciding this is the decision I'm making and I'm going to be fine with it, period. So I took out should, you know, the the expression you're shooting all over yourself. I was shooting all over myself all the time. So everything I was doing, I was like, well, I'm coaching this client now, but that means someone else is with my child and he's now probably going to be emotionally stunted and he isn't learning his ABCs. And I'm like, oh, well, I was gone for an hour. So maybe I'm being a little ridiculous. So it was just some perspective and then just allowing myself to say, this is what it is. This is how it looks for me today or this week. And if I want it different, then I get to be the boss and make it different. And then, you know, some of it was just stopping the constant conversation in my head. Yeah, I relate to a lot of what you're saying there. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out what balance means for me. And it kind of varies because I go through phases. And sometimes it just means working at the time of day when I wanted it, when I want to. Other times it's like working a ton for four days and then not working on Friday or for the whole weekend. And so you're right, it's really personal. And so sometimes reading those things about here's how you get balance can just feel really inauthentic and honestly just be kind of annoying because it doesn't relate to you. And that's actually why I like to ask all of our guests what they do because everyone does such different things. So thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and close with a parting piece of guidance for us. You've already given us so many great insights and we want to get one more before you go. You know, the big thing is this follows emotional intelligence, but it follows just what we can feel in our life in any way or in every way. And that is finding your flow. And I don't mean that to sound hokey or, you know, like I'm doing a downward dog as I say it. There is a genuine moment, though, for me, even in my sort of, you know, otherwise high strung mind that I know I'm operating in my wheelhouse. And I know very distinctly when I'm not. When I am in it, I know that I am more thoughtful and creative and patient with myself and that the results come, that business comes easier to me, that clients are more attracted to me. And then when I try and do something that is not in my wheelhouse, I can feel the rub instantly, right? I feel down. I feel just like my mind is clouded and blocked. I might physically just feel, you know, crappy, whatever it is. So I've learned through trying to fight through that because I thought, well, I'm a capable woman. I won't let this get the best of me. I will fight and I will make this, you know, into what I want it to be. And then I realized that that was, that it never resulted as I wanted it to. It always was a fight and it never had the same ease and, profitability even that being in my flow did. So finding out where you, where you operate best and building on those things versus fighting against the current and trying to be better and great at the things that are naturally not for you. Yes. I love that. So find your flow, figure out what's in your wheelhouse and where you operate best and do more of that. So I hope today's episode inspires you to think more about how you can find your passion and live your best life. For more information, including links to resources that Stephanie and I chatted about today and how best to get in touch with her, head on over to our website, theboostpodcast.com, and check out our show notes from this episode and catch the Boost bonus. Stephanie, I want to thank you for sharing your journey with us today. And remember, anything is possible for you. Now that you've completed this episode, the next step is to join the Boost Squad for strategic insights, tips, and tricks, as well as exclusive resources designed specifically to accelerate your personal and professional growth. All this and more is waiting for you at theboostpodcast.com.